Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to The Reason We Learn. I'm Deb Fellman, your host. And I have a wonderful guest today. I'm very privileged to have Ramona Bessinger with me. She is a teacher, 22-year veteran, a middle and high school teacher, mostly working at the high school level and from Providence, Rhode Island. But before we get to talking to her, I would like to ask you, please, because this is such an important topic, like this video, share this video right now with your friends and colleagues and anybody you know, other parents who would be interested in hearing from a teacher who is on the front lines when it comes to fighting critical race theory in the classroom and other you know, racialized curricula. Um, also, I would ask you to consider subscribing to the channel so that you'll be notified when I make other videos or have other guests on like Ramona and also consider joining my locals community at the reason we learn.locals.com where uh, you can speak with me and other members of the community without ever being censored um, on a Zoom call every Wednesday evening and also post content and so forth. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Ramona, for being here. And um, I just want to like quickly read a little bit from your bio and then you can fill us in what I left out. Yeah. So Ramona, most of Ramona's teaching experience has been at the high school level, specifically American literature and British literature. She has extensive background in curriculum development and implementation and has taught in two school systems. And for the record, she's in Providence, Rhode Island. Most of her students are not white. So I think that's worth mentioning right out of the gate. Okay. So what have I left out? What do they need to know about you before we get started with this conversation? I think that that uh, those are the key points uh, with regards to this particular interview. It's important to know that I do have an extensive curriculum knowledge and that content knowledge coming from my my high school experience and also my own personal education. So I'm not speaking from the heart, although I do speak from the heart on this issue. This issue is driven by, you know, my real concerns here for this highly politicized curriculum in the in the schools. Right. Okay. And for those who are not familiar with Ramona at all, if this is like the first time you're hearing about her, if you're not, don't spend a lot of time on Twitter or you don't read Legal Insurrection, um, Ramona has become quite well known in Rhode Island in particular, but also in the circles of parents who are fighting CRT um, because she did write an article in Legal Insurrection in July, sort of coming out of the closet, if you will, just sort of coming out and saying, Hey guys, alarm, red flags. This is what's going on in the classroom. Um, let me let me tell you about it. And she's uh, one of very few who've who've done that. What prompted you to do that at that time? I, I was absolutely astounded at some of the things that I was seeing. And at the time, I was at a middle school called Isaac Hopkins School in Providence, and. We had new, a new administration take over our curriculum in our school. We had a new principal and slowly but surely sometime around January, I thought this is not some strange things were happening within the department in the English department that were completely unfamiliar to me and shocking to me, namely the curriculum change, the complete um, takeover of our curriculum materials and the English department. Things were not right. And so I spoke at first at the um, oversight hearing in Providence, the Senate on educational oversight hearing, because in particular, I was concerned that data was being mined by the school in order to bolster the uh, the outcome of this new curriculum. So in other words, you can't just roll out a curriculum in a school and say, oh, it's great. You have to have data to support it. So I think that they were using this data incorrectly. And I spoke out because nobody was listening to me at the school that they were, in fact, per the curriculum guidelines, using the, the data incorrectly. So that was initially what I did. I spoke out there and then I wrote this article in Legal Insurrection because I started to notice a very heart, sort of heartbreaking uh, shift in, in sentiment amongst students. There was a, almost mistrust of the country, mistrust of uh, America. And in fact, students started calling me America, which I thought was, you know, you could say, well, who cares, big deal. but. You know, couple that with the curriculum, the books, the, the sort of anti-American sentiment I was sensing. And then, of course, the separation between me and, you know, the 
students, I felt that was alarming to me. And so I felt from the heart, I wanted to write about this because I knew something very significant was happening in the country and in education. And I was seeing it right there in ground, at ground zero uh, at my middle school, Isaac Hopkins in Providence. Now, for, for those watching who aren't familiar with how a curriculum is chosen at a public high school, you mentioned that you started seeing things shifting, things changing. What were you teaching before? Like, what were you given before or told to teach before? And what was happening to the curriculum that you are now being told to work with? And, and who told you? Okay, so this is a really important question because I think the idea of curriculum is very confusing to a lot of parents. And, and I would say even some educators, unless you're an English teacher or a social studies teacher, you really didn't see this, see, you know, this sort of racialized curriculum roll out. So um, initially, what, so in the past, typically our years are broken down into four quarters. Each quarter you teach um, a thematic set of literature. So the first quarter might have been uh, multicultural literature, where we would have had a sampling of, you know, Latin American literature, literature written by um, all different kinds of cultures. And we would have had one core novel. Second, I can't second, hear. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. I so I mi I, I missed all that. <laughs> I'm glad the audience okay. got it. Something so happened like, tonight. Yeah. Oh, so it's okay. Yeah, I'll just really quickly review I'm that. So our sorry. Years are, our years are broken up into four quarters. So first quarter would have been multicultural literature, and we would have had vetted literature during, you know, that quarter that came from all, you know, all sorts of cultures and vetted scholars and 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 folks who have written you know, significantly significant works of literature, right? Yep. And then the second quarter might have been the Holocaust. Third quarter, Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet. Fourth quarter might have been, you know, we might have focused on research paper and poetry, et cetera. So I really, the, the curriculum ceased to look like that. And yes, you know, changes happen. It's okay to, in you know, implement changes. But these changes were like nothing I ever had seen. Be I'd ever seen before. In fact, they were kind of bizarre and are bizarre because there was a sort of this shift away from vetted literature and a move towards this uh, this highly politicized, racialized literature. And so that was that shift, the move away from vetted scholarly works to literature that one, we would say would not be rigorous at all, two, written by authors that were completely unknown to us, three, the literature seemed to be vetted by the New York Times, Amazon or whatever, you know, and, and four, there was an abundance of books that was that were flooding into our classrooms, like by the hundreds, box loads of them. And so all of this was alarming, you know, to have this material in the classroom that nobody apparently had vetted, nobody had even looked at. And we were finding, or I, I can only speak for myself, actually, but there were there was a great deal of pushback by my colleagues on this uh, on this literature, but specifically for me, I thought, well, it's it's almost stupid. Like the books are stupid and dumbing down the curriculum, um, and so that was an, an alarming piece. But the most significant piece for me was the fact that the literature itself seemed highly focused on this racial divide. Mm -hmm. So pitting you know, uh, uh, pitting black culture, Hispanic culture, any culture that was non-white against white culture in America. Right. Not and, and not to mention identifying something called white culture, which heretofore we really didn't talk about in school. We never described, you know, Western enlightenment ideas or culture or things as white culture. It was kind of American. Maybe you might say like, you know, American culture. And then maybe aside from that, you might have some ethnic cultures or, you know, different kinds of cultures, but the sort of generic one that most people publicly live and aspire to and so forth has suddenly became labeled like white culture. 
And that to me is very new. Now, when they brought these books in, um, and you, you mentioned that you and other colleagues were sort of pushing back on them, to whom did you push back internally? And what were you told when you did? Well, I pushed back specifically to my department leader. In fact, we often made jokes about the curriculum. I also pushed back to the consultants, the literary consultants, to which I was told, well, these are books that, you know, we've implemented or are now mandating because, and this is, you know, a, a quote from a consultant who was sort of teaching us how to use this new curriculum. She said, these are books and projects that kids can relate to, meaning African-American children, Hispanic children, but not white children. So this particular literature was already separating children by the color of their skin. And that to me was both alarming, but also um, saddened me a great deal because I thought, you know what, this is not what we wanna do. This is going back in time. This is not actually creating an end and bridging the racial gaps, but so widening this, the gap. This consultant, you mentioned the consultant. So this yes. is, is this a, this is not a district employee and this is not a teacher. No. This is some outside hired professional. Yes. The, um, the books and the curriculum that was uh, rolled out at this middle school came with consultants who gave us specific teaching techniques to use project, project timelines, et cetera, that we needed to um, follow and use. It was a very, that was the other alarming piece is that we couldn't deviate from this very scripted timeline. So this week we're going to talk about, you know, uh, slavery, how, uh, slave, how slaves might have felt during the Civil War, for example, or how uh, westward expansion, how, how, marginalized groups might have felt at that time. Now, let me just be clear that these, these are important subjects for teachers to address with students, but they can't be the only subjects. And we can't teach them in, in, in the exclusion of all other vetted materials. So, you know, when that becomes the only narrative, students at this age, these 12, 13, 14 year old kids begin to believe that this is actually true, that they, they're living in hostile territory and living amongst uh, racists or white supremacists or people who are, you know, in a country that is divided by race. We are not a nation divided by race. Do we have problems in this country? Have we, do we have a history that, that, that has had problems? Of course, but this mm -hmm. is the United States and a country that I feel is very fair and decent and, and, there's lots of proof, you know, in our own culture and, and narrative to show that as well. Right. And I think, you know, it's it's important to note also that you have repeatedly um, said that you, di you don't deny racism. You don't deny that these topics need to be taught as you just did. You, um, you even mentioned in your article that you've always been teaching these subjects as they arrive, as they come up in literature and that, that literature has always been chosen also to address, you know, in context to address these issues. It's just that these are now being taught without any context at all through you through a specific lens of the oppressor oppressed narrative, which is where the critical race theory piece comes in. And as you pointed out in your article, it's not that people are using the words critical race theory in the classroom. They're not doing that. But when you teach the oppressor oppressed, you know, binary us, them, white, black, you know, narrative that everything is divided into, you know, either or like that, you are shaping what the child thinks, not, you know, how they think. They're that not learning right. how. They're being told this is what, how you should view this information and how you should read this literature. And then as you pointed out, the literature itself is so dumbed down and so easy that Stupid. there's not... There's no analysis necessary. It's, it's you know, um, propaganda to begin with, as opposed to literature. That's right. That's correct. And so children are not allowed to develop their own opinions. Um, and that is so important that we leave politics out of the classroom. It doesn't matter what your political persuasion may be, or what your trauma might have been as a child, or what your personal, you know, feelings are about 
controversial issues, we need to leave that out of the classroom, especially in the younger grades. Does that mean that we never ever bring a dis, you know, have a discussion around these issues? Absolutely not. As teachers, we want to have hard discussions with our students. We want to encourage freedom of thought, but this curriculum does not allow children to think freely. They're being intimidated. They're being, you know, they're being indoctrinated to believe that this country is inherently bad and that is dangerous. Now, I know there are people out there who have said and probably will continue to say, oh, she's just saying these things. How are they being intimidated? How are they being manipulated? How are they being indoctrinated? So can you give us some sort of specific salient examples of how that might occur? So, you know, maybe an example of a book or an example of one of these projects or lesson plans that you felt were indoctrinating the children or intimidating them away from sharing their true views. Sure. I mean, I can give you a couple of examples, one from my own son's, my child's school, but also in my own school. I'll give you the first example of the school that I was teaching at this middle school. Um, I was co-teaching in the eighth grade and we were reading a book called Full Cicada Moon. It's a lovely sort of prosaic book for a young girl's coming of age story where she's um, part of an interracial family. Her mother is Japanese, father is African-American. They moved to Vermont. And this young girl experiences racism on every corner, every single day, at every, you know, juncture in her life. And so after a while, the students in this class spoke to me and said, you know, they, they were kind of like sick and tired of that same story being told that they were somehow victims. They didn't want to be victims anymore. The kids did. But yet, when you have, I was co-teaching the class and the co-teacher was very sort of active politically and pushed the kids to think in this way. And the kids, of course, being children, want to please the adult, right? So it's really not fair for adults to impose their political views onto children and then drive it home with this literature day in, day out. They're young people, they're, they're forming their own opinions. And so I saw firsthand how it was being kind of imposed on the children. And in other classes, I saw uh, certain teachers actually conflating and making comparisons between the Civil War and riots occurring in the country, in the currently in the country. And I thought these are seventh graders, for goodness sakes, like, let them understand history, let them understand the atrocities that occurred in history, but you should not be encouraging violent behavior. You should not be sort of militarizing or weaponizing these children so that they think like you do. That right. is wrong. And in my son's school, you know, it's ridiculous. He's taking an American literature class. Actually, you know, I call it an anti-American literature class because all the literature points to that oppressed versus the oppressor narrative. It's the same thing. Again, you have kids who are 15 years old. Well, the last thing a 15 year old wants to do is vo voice his or her, you know, concerns for what the teacher is, is teaching. Are you kidding me? I mean, they've got to give the kid the grade, right? My son mm -hmm. is going to be graded by this teacher, this, this very sort of political activist teacher who's injecting all her feminist views and making him feel ashamed, one, to be a male, and two, to be a white male. I, you know, it has to be spoken this word, these words, right? Yeah, we're all thinking it. Parents are alarmed across the country. No one's mm -hmm. saying it, but this is happening. The kids, we need to be more objective in the classroom. We need to respect yeah. families. We need to respect parents and children and not assume that our children are going to embrace your political views just because you feel passionately, passionately about it. So I've seen it in my son's class, which is a ridiculous class. You know, it's called American Lit, 10th grade American Lit. There's nothing American about it. It is 100 percent, you know, anti-American Lit. And by the way, highly focused on sex as well. That's a whole other issue. But also I've seen it in, uh, in the classroom first at the middle school. And I see it also at the high school in Providence. You know, kids are being encouraged to write about this sort of oppressed, 
oppressor narrative in specifically history class and in English class. Now, are there, uh, you have spoken out, you know, most publicly, but are you aware of other teachers who feel as you do, who are just intimidated out of speaking? Yes. There are many. And, okay. and I don't, and a lot of people have said to me, well, why aren't teachers coming forward? Well, they're electing just to resign. And Providence is a great example of how many resignations are occurring. They're happening every single day. You know, teachers are getting burnt out. And rather than fight this, they're electing to leave. And I've chosen not to leave, although there are many, there were many times when I felt like this is not a healthy situation, it's not a safe situation for me, but I feel compelled to stay in the fight. Fight as a parent and fight as an educator for the per only profession that I've really known my entire, you know, my entire life and to fight for this. But do teachers elect not to do the? Uh, yes, for good reason, because look what's happening to me. I'm right. being well made an example of, Right. I've been harassed, bullied specifically by my own union, which actually circulated a petition about me. You know, when I went back to school after writing this very sort of heartfelt uh, blog for legal insurrection, they actively ganged up on me. So, yes, there is a compelling reason why a lot of teachers may elect to remain quiet. It's not easy to speak out and take a stand. And yes, they have messaged me privately. I've received messages, both written and um, you know, phone messages that have been left on my cell phone from teachers who have supported me from all over the country and some, in some cases abroad. Wow. Now, I know um, because I follow you on Twitter, I know there have been um, some other specific things that they've done. Can you share with the audience some of the specific things that people within the school have done to you just on a day to day basis to try to get you, you know, to intimidate you into being silent? Yes. Well, when I started school at the middle school, I was at uh, Isaac Hopkins immediately day one. I was approached by a colleague who engaged me in what I felt like was a hostile conversation about my position. And this colleague accused me of being insensitive. She accused me of being um, privileged, white privileged, she said, in fact. And she kind of was threatening in the sense that she was saying she was going to embrace lesson plans and the teachings of Malcolm X and Angela Davis. And I said to her, why would you do that? You're teaching, you know, sixth graders. Well, how, how are they supposed to understand this political view of yours? And, and why, you know, what is it specifically in my words in my blog that I wrote for Legal Insurrection that's, that, that implies that I'm privileged in any way, shape or form. I work very hard. I work two jobs. I shouldn't have to even say that, you know, I shouldn't have to even be put in a position where I'm justifying or defending my, my, myself based on a ridiculous emotion felt uh, notion of white privilege. Okay. Mm -hmm. I asked her to articulate what white privilege meant and she started to get very annoyed and sort of grandstand in front of my colleagues. Another colleague actually attacked me and said to me specifically in a faculty meeting to uh, be quiet or shut up that nobody wanted to hear what I had to say. Now he did apologize to me after the meeting, uh, but you know, the damage is done, right? The message is clear. The intimidation is I don't know how you apologize for shut up. No one wants to hear from you. Yeah. Like that's that was you know there's sorry. That yeah, was, no, that's just wild. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it is wild. It gets wilder. You know, it was the same day that my union rep told me that there was a petition that he didn't want to show me circulating around the school. And that if I create if I disagreed with some of the things that the principal was saying. And the principal, you know, it's just absolute ridiculous and harassment on a day to day basement that I suffered at that school. And uh, it got so bad and I still didn't back down. I would like I'm very proud to say because I believe in this and I believe in this for all children of all colors that this is wrong. 
to marginalize black children and marginalize white children, separate everybody by their race, by their sex, by their gender, by whatever is a is really child abuse. And so I, I did not back down after even that day, but I'll, I'll tell you, it was not easy to sense that sort of hostility. So then it went further. Then the kids got involved. You know, they, they, they find uh, the weakest or the kids who are most vulnerable and seeking out the approval of adults. And suddenly kids started thinking I was racist. So I asked my students, why do you think I'm racist? Like, in what, what have I ever said or done? Of course, there's no answer, right? There's no legitimate discourse or discussion. There's no trying to mitigate the situation. It just escalated and escalated towards me. Wow. And what did they do to you? What did these children do to you? Well, as I wrote, or as was written in Legal Insurrection, kids were allowed to, well, kids are frequently allowed to roam the halls and, um, and, you know, come and go as they please under various guises, one of them social emotional learning. So I'm sure there was an excuse for this, but a couple of kids left and this was coming, this came firsthand to me from the teacher who was in charge of uh, looking after this classroom. She said that they left uh, an auditorium where all the kids had gathered for something, gone into my classroom, vandalized the classroom. Is that when they wrote they wrote insults and horrible things about you yes. on your whiteboard, right? Right. Yes. And what what was the consequence? Did they suffer any consequences? Did anyone come to you and mm -hmm. uh, try to reassure you or say what they were going to do? No, they did not. They did not try to mitigate the situation in any way, shape, or form. What they did was remove me from the school after publicly humiliating me, making an example of me, making me sit in a faculty room for an entire day freezing cold temperatures and they you know gave me no reason I just basically I wrote the superintendent and I said there are some things happening at the school I need somebody to help me out and mitigate the situation it was ignored nothing was done on a professional level to assist me with this escalating hostility towards me and so you know, what happened sort of subsequent to this final straw with the kids, which made me more sad than anything, but it also spoke to this escalating violence that was, or potential violence that could have happened or occurred. Right. So I, I sought out the help of the administration, nothing. I went into school, I think the following Monday or some around October 18th, I was told to go sit in the faculty room for the day. And then sometime later that day at the end of school, my union rep uh, called me on the way home and she nonchalantly said, oh, you're being transferred out to another school an involuntary transfer. And I said, why, on what grounds? And her response was, because you, you were concerned about your safety. Well, sure, I was concerned about my safety, but you know, you expect the school to step in, mitigate and try to mend and, and reassure students and faculty that I am not what they think and that I should not be singled out, you know, in this manner. Well, transferring um, you is, is, it looks a lot more like a punishment yes. than support because yes. now they're just yes. passing the, passing you off to someone else. And it sends a message to the students, you win, right? Yes. You know, you get, get rid of this, the teacher that is problematic or whatever yeah. it is. And, yeah. and, um, it seems to me, they tried to even leverage your, um, you know, what you're speaking out against you. Yes, um, you they know, if they couldn't silence you, well, now we're going to leverage it to send a message to the kids about how activism works. Look, you get rid of the people you don't like when you do this. And mm -hmm. the, you know, what I've been trying to say on this channel is while we're not teaching the things we would like to be teaching in our schools, we are teaching things. We are teaching important lessons. They're just not lessons that are conducive to, um, sustaining a free and prosperous Republic. We're teaching these kids to be fragile. We're teaching them to be bullies. We're teaching them to be racist. We're teaching them to, that their every whim should be satisfied. And if it isn't, they should get good and angry and start, you know, protesting. And that's how we solve problems is we just yell and scream and pound our feet. We teach people to be toddlers. 
And we're supposed to be doing the opposite. Worse. We're teaching them to be activists. We're teaching them to to rise up and, and, and uh, act in a sort of, you know, revolutionary like way and in a violent way. And I think that in itself is, is problematic. And we need to be very concerned about that in this country. Right. I saw about a week ago that um, Secretary Cardona uh, wrote about the teaching of Animal Farm in the schools. He was writing it to a group of students. He had a, a thing on the Department of Education letterhead and so forth. And I thought at first, I said, oh, he likes this book. How refreshing. And then I read what he had to say about the book. And he completely recast the entire point of the book into being a, you know, an explanation for why communism hasn't worked before because of the evil, greedy capitalists. And they, he recast the pigs as evil, greedy capitalists. And he cast the animals that were being oppressed by the pigs as the workers in the communist society that was desperately trying to do do the right thing and instead the evil greedy people the evil greedy capitalists had you know not allowed communism to function properly it was basically wow. the gist of it so that's another important thing is that even if you were able to get rid of these books the dumb books right and even if you were able to bring in some of the older books i'm starting to see that they are already gearing up to go okay okay teachers okay parents We'll go back to the old stuff, but they're still going to ask you to do it in a way that comes at it through this lens. They just didn't have the time yet. Yes. Right. And of course, they spend a bunch of money on a bunch of stupid books that they'll just replace. No problem. Well, that is, in fact, happening at at the high school level. In some of the schools, um, you don't have the platforms that exist that K through eight. You have... um, you know, they're using Anne Rand, for example, not necessarily to point out the harms or, or worry or concern or fears of, of collect, uh, communism or whatever, but they're using Anne Rand and, and certain, certain vetted books to advance this notion that capitalism is evil, that Americans and American culture is imperialistic. We are colonists. In fact, our professional development is framed, you know, most of the professional development is framed around how we are colonist teacher, teachers, you know, so you're exactly right. They, the, you know, I'm trying to figure out how you teach Ayn Rand as if it's like anti-capitalist. That is astonishing. The only way you could pull it off is if you didn't teach any entire book and you instead pulled a passage and you then, you know, propagandized it. That I cannot for the life of me see how you cast any of these characters in a negative light without dropping all context and not allowing them to read an entire book. And of course, I don't know how they would read. You can't read Atlas Shrugged. It's over a thousand pages. You won't have time and they're not good enough readers. Yes. You might read Anthem, but I mean, Anthem makes it pretty clear that it's a dystopian nightmare where the, the first person singular doesn't exist. It's also a lesson on why pronouns are important. But, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, I read all of these books and I'm I'm absolutely baffled how are they teaching ayn rand as if this is anti-capitalist well there's this term these two terms uh, individualism versus collectivism and collectivism is sort of framed in this very positive light whereas individualism is framed in a very negative light so american culture and history is all circles all around the individual spirit the strength of the individual and the ability to to overcome all obstacles that is inherently you know our our culture and our history is framed around that the revolutionary war the the declaration of independence um you know the bill of rights all of these documents speak to who we are as americans and um how you know, some literature, Locke and Locke was, uh, you know, I was uh, quoted the other day as well, how that is sort of framed around this collectivism and individualism is, is quite astounding. But this, this idea that we collectivism or the group is more important than the individual is really pushed as well. And that, you know, how exactly it's done in individual classes is just 
It sounds like Marx, Kant, and Rousseau had a baby, and they sent him in to teach Ayn Rand. It sounds absolutely awful. And as you point out, anti-American. There's really yeah. no other term, folks, for it. So it's not hyperbole to say that this is an anti-American approach, because as Ramona points out, um, if there is such a thing as Americanism, not nationalism, but American, like in terms of a philosophy that we that we embody, okay, as Americans, it would be more Lockean than Marxian. That's it right. would be more individualistic than collectivist. And collect. in fact, it was anti-collectivist quite explicitly. Even Frederick Douglass, who was approached by socialists, said, no, thank you to socialism and was quite adamant about it. And yet here we have them teaching these kids that the only right way is this way that is anti-American. I would even go so far as to call it insurrectionist. Since oh. the word insurrection has been bandied about in the past year, I think it's worth digging it up because insurrection doesn't have to involve rioting or breaking windows or showing up with weapons. One of the most powerful weapons of insurrection is, is words. You know, um, in fact, in point of fact, the revolution itself, the American Revolution, was begun using pamphlets. And every farmer had lock in his coat pocket as he's plowing his field. So, you know, words and ideas begin the, the notion of, you know what, we don't want a king anymore. We don't want this king. And we were raised, you and I, to think that was a good thing to cast off the shackles of this collectivist, you know, imperialist stuff and be an individualistic Near, uh, country that protected individual rights and now it seems like people are longing for the protective warm blanket of world government i mean that's what it feels like to me no it, your your feelings are let me validate them that's exactly what's happening you know in the schools and again these children our students are going to be graduating becoming members of society and lord knows what our society is going to look like in a few years, it scares me to think, you know, exactly what American society is going to actually look like if we don't get this under wraps. It is a harm to our society. It's, uh, it's dangerous. And it sort of speaks to, um, you know, when you, when you talk about collectivism and rioting and activism, well, I think anyone can kind of put together exactly what's happening. And really what is happening is a coup d'etat in, and they're using our schools and our young people to, to, to accomplish that coup. It's right. basically and stealing our country. Right. Using the children first, which is what Mao yes. did. I mean, you know, so each of these tyrants has had their, you know, approach with education. Hitler did it. He said, you know, as soon as the babies are born, it's like, we'll give you a job and ch free child care, hand over your baby, and we will have the Hitler Youth girls, the young Madel, they'll take care of the babies and the boys will go into Hitler Youth and the women and the men will go off to work. And look, everyone's employed. We put everybody back to work, except guess who's raising your children? The state. Next thing you know, your children, your family doesn't exist. Like family is not a concept in the totalitarian society. Because family puts some distance between you and the state. The state is your mommy. The state is your daddy. And I feel like they're trying to do the same thing with our kids right now. They're putting mental health centers right in the school. They're asking, how are you feeling? How are you doing? What's going on? Do you want some meds? I mean, they're doing this inside the school and even going so far as to imply that the parents are the enemy. Not imply. They're directly stating it. We're oh, domestic yes. terrorists. They're right? actual. Yes, they're actual directives that uh, going out to teachers to bond, act as the parents, you know? And again, when you- They're actually school, saying that? Oh, the principal at my school said it regularly. I was astounded. I called him out on it. He actually said he himself felt like he was the parent while the kids were at school, you know? We were told to, um, under the guise of social emotional learning, we were told to collect formal and informal data on our students. We were also told that kids could leave our classrooms and not have to account for where they were going. And I pushed Even back- Even parents don't do that. <laughs> That's not a good parent. 
You can't, it's insanity, absolute insanity. And, you know, I've been shouting it to the rooftops and, you know, apparently everyone's so like afraid. You've got the politicians are, are terribly afraid. Legislators are terribly afraid to, to push back. Everybody's afraid, right? They're afraid of losing their jobs. They're afraid of losing, you know, whatever bonus they're going to get. Everybody's being plied with money. School districts are being plied with ESSER funds. Politicians are being plied with cushy little, you know, jobs or, you know, who knows what, you know, everybody is getting something and they're selling the country and selling children down the river for their own personal gain. Or maybe they're just useful idiots and they actually believe that this curriculum is in some way fair and, uh, fair and decent. It is not, it is so harmful and yeah, so is, wrong. It is harmful. Um, I we need to laugh earlier, but really you can't make oh, I'm it sorry. I said, I didn't mean to laugh earlier, but no, so it's, uh, I've done that on this Sorry. channel. There have been so many times I've said things and I start laughing and I think people are like, that's not funny. Deb. Like no. this is, this is the kind of laughter that comes from complete, you know, like just terror, you know, when you just cannot even believe this is happening, it should yeah. be a joke, but it's not. And, you know, James Lindsay does this thing on Twitter. He goes honk, you know, because the the people are ridiculous and part of why they've, they're getting away with this we take them seriously and and we're afraid when what we need to do is laugh at them and we need to treat them as the clowns they are instead of <laughs> acting like they're our masters yeah. another thing i i listened to today and i highly recommend it to everyone i don't know if you ever listened to sovereign nation on on youtube but um he was talking about he was comparing what's going on to sort of the wizard of oz oh. and all the people you just mentioned are like wizards of Oz. You know, they're hiding behind a curtain. They're not really all powerful. They can't give us all the goodies they say they're going to give us. They can't fix all the problems they claim they're going to fix. Just like the all powerful, you know, wizard of Oz. They're sending us out to do all these things and saying, well, if you just do this, you know, if you, you get the wicked witch's broom, then I will, you know, grant you your heart and your courage and your this and that. And of course, what do they learn at the end of the story? They always had those things. They had the courage. They had the, they had the heart. They had all of the things they needed to get the, to get the witch's broom in the first place. And the all powerful mighty Oz didn't. And his point was, we, the people have so much more power than we think we have. It's called our brains and our voices. And we're allowing fear of their almighty power to take over. And with every passing day that we let the, the worst wizard of all, which is, you know, the guy that starts with F and ends with ouchie, that guy is the king of the wizards and, and, and saying, you know, well, I am science. And then the people in the schools, I am education. I am this, I am that we parents and teachers, caring teachers such as yourself, I think need to do what you're doing, you know, and, and be Ramona. You know, be, be that in whatever capacity you can be, you know, open your mouth and say, this doesn't make sense. You're yes. not making sense of the world. You're making nonsense of the world. Yes, agreed. People do need to feel they have a platform. You know, parents across the country are, are, are enraged at what they're seeing. They, I've never seen as a teacher, this is the other thing, just to speak to your point. I have never seen parents speaking out and being, you know, labeled domestic terrorists and, and basically beaten down into submission, pulled out of these um, school committee uh, meetings. I've never seen anything like this. So, but the message is clear. If you do this, there's going to be pushback. They're going to harass you. The thugs will come looking for you. And really, if I can say anything in this uh, in this interview is that you cannot be afraid. You have to stand up to the school committee members, to the corrupt politicians, you know, stand up to the tyranny, because if you don't do it, your fear is going to be compounded in many more ways because There's they're not going to stop. That's right. We are yeah. in great trouble here. You know, kids it, it's really, really egregious what is happening and, and everyone needs to speak out. But, you know, when you have money, jobs, um, health care, all of those things are compelling reasons why people are afraid to speak out. And then just sort of like ignorance or not understanding. I don't want to say ignorance, but just a lack of understanding about how curriculum works 
and exactly what children are being taught and how they're being manipulated in this way. So, you know, schools become a very ripe playing field for these political agendas to get rolled out and to to advance their political agendas. It's right. it's a crime. So, but we do, we need to speak out. Everybody does. And you so you're you're still you're still in it. I mean, you're still there. You're still trying. Now, when you are, you have no choice but to teach these dumb books, right? I'm not teaching anything. Currently, they have oh, me. They, they have you suspended. Oh, they transferred they, you. So they, they threaten suspension, but lo and behold, there was no suspension. The suspension was part of their, you know, public humiliation and sort of smearing my, you know, discredit, trying to discredit me and moving me, right? Like when they did that, then it looks to the public, to parents, to the community, like I've done something wrong. Sure. So what are they suspending me on? I've done nothing wrong. They have no grounds to suspend me or fire me. So what do they do? They move me to a school and to no fault of the poor principal on the first day I said to him, I you know, I'm sorry, but that I'm here because it's going to, you know, it's a problem for him. Uh, but here I am nonetheless. And they have me sitting in, in a um, basement resource room doing very little next to nothing all day. So I'm making good use of my time, you know, get participating in professional development, looking very closely at all the professional development materials and mm -hmm. sharing those as well. So even though they've um, sequestered me, so to speak, in the basement of this very nice high school. Um, there I am. Isn't that sick, you guys? Like, yeah. they don't want students to learn from this woman. Here we have somebody who loves this country, obviously, who is a critical thinker, who has their best interest at heart. She's not wanting them to think a specific thing about America other than you know, truthfully what it is. Okay. Um, she's clearly aligned with what we all used to believe were American values, whether you were a Democrat or Republican or a libertarian or a green, it kind of didn't matter. We used to at least value the bill of rights. We used to think that individuals had rights and those were to be protected by government and not, you know, we weren't supposed to be part, like, part of the Borg. This, this was just understood. You could have friends from other parties and disagree on the finer points of policy, but you all at the end of the day said, yeah, you know, I think freedom of speech is really, really important and we shouldn't infringe on that. The ACLU was even on board with that. And, you know, we should have the Second Amendment. We might disagree on who could have the guns when and where, but we agree that that should exist. And now, now it's like two different countries. You have, and they're, they're basically saying, and you heard her say, they call her America. They've banished America to the basement, folks. They've banished America to the basement. <laughs> that is a, as strong a symbol as you're going to get. So I don't know how else to raise the alarm <laughs> here. I've been doing it for the better part of a year, more than a year, actually, on this channel. And I know that Ramona has been doing it and Nicole Solis and Moms for Liberty and, you know, no left turn in education and parents defending ed and so many organizations have sprung up. If you are watching this and listening to this and you are not already a member of a chapter of one of those groups, I don't care which one. Pick one. Doesn't matter. OK, just yes. if you are not already finding people to support and align with to amplify your voice and 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 defend your freedoms you're going to lose them it's not a matter of if it's when yes it the, the, we 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 are we've run out of time we have literally i mean ayn rand said a frightening number of years ago i mean back in 1970 she wrote the comper chicos which i covered on this channel about american progressive education and what it was doing that was in 1970 go read that essay and you will your your spine will tingle but even go back when to when she wrote atlas shrugged we're living it we're living it and you know you've got teachers like ramona and she's not alone and they're being banished to the basement it's true. It's, I mean, what else? They've, they've, are you allowed? I mean, you mentioned in your article, they don't say the Pledge of Allegiance, which some people have feelings about the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, fine. But they don't, they're taking American flags out of classrooms. Yes, they are in some classrooms. And, and in some classrooms, the, the teachers are encouraging the kids not to stand. That is a fact. 
that is happening now. I will say that the, the principal at my school now, he recites the Pledge of Allegiance every single day. We stand, even though there's three of us in this room. Um, and I appreciate that. Um, but I will, I know for a fact that in certain classrooms, teachers are encouraging children to sit down. Why would you encourage children to sit down when the words, you know, basically empower the children to speak right. and to have a voice? Why would you sit down and protest those words? It makes no sense. Right. It's absolute ridiculous nonsense that is taking place. And people, people wow. misconstrue it. When you stand for the flag, you are not standing for a piece of magic sky cloth. You are not standing. No, I mean, it's not, you're not worshiping it and you're not being nationalistic. You're standing to respect the values it represents. You are standing individually on the spot you occupy on free soil to show your own power as an individual to stand up and never kneel. You're standing because you can. You are standing to respect the people who died holding that piece of cloth so you could stand and yeah. not kneel. It's not because you're worshipful. And I wish it weren't called a Pledge of Allegiance. I wish it were more sort of a, a, a Pledge of Allegiance to the values for which it stands. But, yeah. you know, guys... You can, you can throw it out and say like, well, I don't want to be me. And you know what the real religion is right now that they're pushing on our children? The state. That's the religion. And they want your kids to stand for that. Oh, no, I'm sorry. They want them to kneel. There's a reason they're kneeling and calling it good because they want to teach our kids they're going to spend the rest of our lives on their knees. Or worse. Yeah, or worse. That'll be the good day. The good day is when they can kneel and say, more, please. Yeah. Please, more, Massa. And that's just the truth. I mean, people are asking if they can please go back to work. Can I please expose my face? May I please participate in society? Do I have your permission? This is the United States of America. We don't ask permission to exercise our freedoms. That's right. That is right. That is, uh, you're exactly right. It's, it's a very sad day. And, you know, what is happening in our country is not good with the divide, the unrest. I've never, you know, parents you know, devastated and children, you know, being silenced. I, you know, kids are experiencing anxiety at record levels and it's not related to COVID, although, this is the new, you know, in order to sort of scoop up the ESSER funds and 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 uh, bl everything is blamed on COVID. No, it's because of this highly politicized curriculum that is being pushed. You know, kids aren't ready for this sort of thing. They're not yet adults and their brains haven't yet formed. You know, let them be children and stop bringing in, you know, discussions and secrecy and uh, bizarre notions about the country designed to divide and create anxiety and fear. This has got to stop. And I am appealing to legislators to get involved. And if it means that they have to sacrifice in the same way that Nicole has sacrificed, that I am sacrificing, that teachers who are leaving the profession are sacrificing. So what? Right. Throw a set, we can, as we say. We can build you know? new, we can we can build new systems while we still can. Hello. Um, I you know, which brings me to my 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 sort of last question, which would be it seems ridiculous to ask it now, but do you have any hopes for reforming the public system as it currently is? Or do you think we have to just build a parallel system and move on? I don't think a parallel system will ever work. And current, and by the way, why should we have to build a parallel system? We pay taxes. Why should these thugs at the Rhode Island Department of Education, the NEA of Rhode Island, the National you know, Education Association, why should they be, Randy Weingarten, why should they be able to use our tax dollars to overthrow the country. 
They don't have the right to do that. And we need to have legislators hold these unions accountable for what they're doing, for implementing and supporting and threatening and basically coercing teachers into teaching this garbage. And we need to hold the Rhode Island Department of Education as well as all the other school boards that are using our tax dollars, whether you call them ESSER funds or whatever, Right. to pay for these curriculums that are being rolled out in the schools. They are causing suffering, pain, anxiety, worry, violence, and really, truly, we need to hold these people accountable. Forget the parallel system. Forget homeschooling, because that's not going to solve the problem, because they're going to come for you at your homeschool. The parallel school, school systems, that'll never, that is not, no, forget that. We are entitled and deserve a fair and decent and objective education. And they need to be stopped. We should not have to run away from the system we are paying into. Well, I would agree that we, we I would put it slightly differently. We shouldn't have to pay for a system that we have to run away from. So in other words, I think the dollars should follow the children and parents should have a complete choice. It should have been done a long, long time ago. Compulsory schooling is kind of, you know, the way they do it with the funding, the way yeah. they do it. I'm not opposed to a public option, but I just think the way it's been done has been tailor made to result in what we're seeing. Yeah. I think it's also ironic that they talk about imperialistic Americans, you know, colonizing. Da, da, da. What have they done? The, what is more imperialistic than having people yes. in Washington, D.C. decide what everybody, we're a republic, right? We are a republic, a union of states. What is more imperialistic than to decree what you must teach and what you must do in order to get much needed funds after you've been shut down and your economy is shut down for the better part of two years. What, what is more on. what is more colonizing than to go into a given state or in a given district and say, you know, we, the consultants of the blah, 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 have decided this is what you have to do and this is the culture you will promote and this is the, you know, the family system we will recognize and the other family systems are bad. To me, what that is worse that is an or because you're making us pay for it. That is an order of magnitude worse than what colonialists, you know, colonists did when they just came over and said, "Oh, look, empty land." Yes. Well, what looks empty anyway, and you don't really have a system of laws and private property doesn't isn't really your thing. So I don't see anybody living here. I'm going to live here. That's they're telling us that that's oppressive and terrible and horrible. Meanwhile, they come to places where like we do have property rights and we do have a system in place and we do have a culture and we do have a family and we are parents. And you want to tell us you can't be, you don't and give us your money and take it or leave it. I love that. I, I agree with you hundred percent. That's exactly what's happening. Can I just really quickly speak to the whole school choice issue? Years ago, school choice worked, right? To, to argue that point, to have charter schools. I was a big supporter of charter schools. In fact, I thought charter schools were a good idea, school choice. But I want to just share something because this is very, very important. Even if we were, say we were able to have a parallel system or school choice or break these corrupt teachers unions down and the PTU, the Providence Teachers Union is the biggest corrupt teachers union, including Mary Beth Calabro, even if we were able to do that, okay, you still have the departments of education. And well, that's got to go. Well, but that's, that's the first thing that's got to go. <laughs> you don't have the school choice will never exist. So long as the federal government is dictating oh, to the, you know, the state school boards, and the state school boards yeah. are in league in this respect with the uh, with the teachers unions to roll out this curriculum. You will 100%. never have, you'll never have charter schools or school choice. So we need to put that to rest for now. And right. we need to focus on getting rid of these unions, getting rid of these departments of education. They're right. corrupt to the core. Let's bring back an, an objective curriculum, vetted curriculum materials, and fire any teacher who doesn't want to teach the truth. Right. And then talk about school choice and charter schools. But that has to come, you know, they have dismantled well, our schools here in Rhode Island. We need to rebuild them. I think, I think in order it would be, you know, like if I were elected president tomorrow kind of thing, right? I would, I would immediately 
get rid of the Department of Education, the U.S. Oh, Department yeah. of Education. Yes. I, I mean, I might be the least popular person who ever lived in the short term or the most, depending on who you talk to, but it would be gone. It's only yeah. been there since Carter. It needs to go. Everything has been, gone downhill since its formation. So that's the okay. first thing. The next thing I would do, and I hope if there were a friendly Congress, is I would ask Congress to please pass a law making public sector education unions illegal. If you want to go have your own little private association of teachers, but no collective bargaining with taxpayer dollars, none of this. No, no, no. So we've yeah. already moved in the right direction with making dues paying optional. The, that stood up in the Supreme Court. Let's take it all the way. The, even Franklin Roosevelt said that pub, public sector unions should not be legal. And yet there, we, there they are. So that's got to go. We should not be hiring public sector union teachers, period, end of conversation. And then we can restore schools to the states. And then it becomes a lab. Then it becomes, yes. okay, Florida is doing it one way, Texas is doing another, yes. and as it should be. And then uh, to your point, then we can have a conversation about what happens next. But those are the first two things that have to happen. Without that happening, it will right. never, you will never see reform. So those of you in the audience who are telling me you'll never get rid of the Department of Education or you'll never get rid of the, the unions, to. We it's have that or nothing, guys. It, that's it. Or homeschool. Yes. There is no other way. You will not succeed in reforming U.S. public education with teachers unions in place and with the Federal Department of Education in place. It is a non-starter. Take your black pill and call me in the morning. That's that's beautiful. Well said. And I agree with you 100 percent. We have to dismantle the Department of Education, dismantle the unions. They're so corrupt and they're useless, by the way. They you know, they do nothing for teachers and to raise, you know, they do nothing to to help children. Absolutely nothing. They tow the political party line, period, full stop. And that is it. Yep. They are uh, a make work program and money laundering operation for the Democratic oh. Party. There you go. That's it. Okay. It's like organized crime. The way organized crime works to make jobs for losers and then m m launder money for criminals, that's what the unions do. Straight up, that's all they do. Sure. They do not improve the outcomes of students. They do not actually help teachers because when's the last time they lobbied for you know things that actually help teacher autonomy in the classroom, more say in what they're teaching, more professional standards to reward merit. No, 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 no. Can't have that. We got to reward mediocrity because they're the more loyal members. Agreed. And and our teachers union is, I mean, you know, you've got Mary Beth Calabra out there talking about white affinity groups, black affinity groups, and then and when calling she's Nicole the racist. Oh my goodness. And, affinity exactly. groups. And then like when she's, she's questioned in a reasonable fashion to, you know, or, or asked to explain what white, you know, privilege actually means, oh, she runs away and hides and shuts her uh, Twitter account in fear of a reasonable, decent, you know, question posed by Nicole Solis on Twitter. So, you know what? She's a disgrace. The entire union is a disgrace. And currently what they're allowing to happen to me you know, they should really be held accountable for that as well. So I'm right. with you 100%. And, right. you, you and just so everybody knows who's watching YouTube censors, we are not calling for anything remotely violent. We are not calling for anyone to be threatened. We are not calling for anybody to have any kind of harassment. In fact, please don't. If you are watching this right now, please don't go run over to these Twitter accounts or Facebook accounts and start harassing these people. That's not how it's done. I also recommend against going to school board meetings and screaming into microphones. You've got to be smarter about how you do this. Go to your legislators. They actually have power. School boards have some power with superintendents, but they're not responsive. They don't want to hear from you. They're in cahoots with the unions. So if the, the random school board member who might be on your side is one person who can't collaborate with the others because of open meeting laws. So you're basically banging your head against a brick wall in most cases. You've got to go to the actual lawmakers and you've got to go with receipts and with specific demands. And you've got to go about this differently. OK, and you've got to go grassroots and go door to door to parents and really talk to them face to face so they can hear you're a human. You're not this dehumanized profile behind a social media app that they can be nasty to you face to face. 
and show them what's being done and ask them if they're okay with their child being made to feel inferior or whatever it is. And if they still say yes and move on to the next person, but you don't need to convince all of them. You just need to empower many of them. And you've got it that, but you got to open your mouth. You're, no one's fixing this for you. No mm. new president is going to fix this. Like I said, if I were president tomorrow, that's what I would do. I'm never going to be president. And, and good luck making sure that somebody you actually like will ever be president again, but that's a whole other video. Just you are, no one's saving you. Superman is not coming. You have that's to cool. solve this at the local level or it isn't solved. That's and if, if that's not going to be soon enough for you, then homeschool is triage. Homeschooling is, you know, what you're going to do for your individual child. But guess what? Your kid, just like I homeschool, I do this every day in spite of the fact that I'm homeschooling because my children have to grow up in this country. They have to live with all the public school kids who will be also running businesses and government and so forth and so on. I can't take a back seat because I'm individually protecting my little kids. This is our country and we have to fight for it. And education is the front line. That is correct. Beautiful Sorry to go stuff. off in a rant there. I just you know, it's, it's an important rant to have. Thank you. I so appreciate so, that rant. Well, thank you because you're sticking your neck out. I'm just on the internet. They'd have to come to my house and get me. You're literally there on the battlefield. Like you're, you know, I hate to keep using these metaphors, but you're trying to teach and they won't let you. You haven't quit. You haven't given up. And folks, this woman should be in the classroom. Students need to hear from her. This kind of courage is what we want our students to have. We want our students to have model role models for courage. Remember JFK? Profiles in Courage? Did anyone read it? Does anyone remember it? Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, so I think, Ramona, that you are a profile in Courage. Okay. And I appreciate you. And I, I am... You know, I hope that the, there are people in your district who appreciate you and support you and will stand with you and not just allow America to be banished to the basement. How sad is that? It's so it's if it weren't so ridiculous and, you know, I, I it's, it's the laughter is really because of the ridiculousness of it all. But How can the people watching this support you? What can they do? Is there anything that we can do to help you short of getting this word out? Is Getting the you word out need? Is, is key and everyone should be going to their legislators and we need to demand that the 2019 bill or whatever bill, whatever state you're in, if they gave, if, it, if, if a bill, if legislation was passed, giving your school board 100% authority, uh, authority over the curriculum, get that reversed first. That bill needs to be reversed here in Rhode Island. And then we need to restore curriculum, curriculum mandates and changes back to the community so that the parents have an, can influence school boards. Because currently, these poor school committee members, some of them might be on board, but many of them are just living in fear of, you know, uh, the Wizard of Oz there at the Rhode Island Department of Education hiding behind the curtain, right, with her mandates. So... Um, that's, that's what we need to do. We need to yeah. take our country back and start with legislation and we need to all do it together and speak out and go to school committee meetings. And as you say, make yourself physically known, do yeah. not back down and it's educate yourself about how to do it so that you are going with specifics, specific demands and using the right vocabulary. And if you're not sure, then message you know, me. <laughs> yes, message Ramona. So Thank you, everybody, for coming today. Thank you, Ramona, for being here and spending your time with me and helping to educate us about what's going on right there. I hope they put you back in a classroom. But as you say, you're doing important work, even so, looking at these professional standards and uh, professional development stuff. So yeah, if you have anything... If you have anything interesting, you know where to send it. <laughs> I can uh, I can help you expose it. There's lots of us who will. But... <laughs> yes. Well, I, I thank you again. And uh, thanks everyone for coming. Please share this out so more people see it. And um, please consider subscribing to the channel. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you.